I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture about the case Public Citizen v. Young, a D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals case from 1987. And here we're talking about statutory precision and its consequences. Now, for my students, a lot of the cases in our uh, first chapter or two of the casebook are about the non-delegation doctrine, which is really a problem of what happens when statutes are too vague or ambiguous or open-ended and they give the executive branch basically too much discretion to just kind of wing it or fill in the gaps. And so here we're talking about the opposite problem. What happens when we have a statute that's very specific and doesn't allow any flexibility and then the agency is, do we expect the agency to rigidly follow it? And so um, the, the intuitions here are sort of reversed from a lot of the other cases that we study in our course where courts are concerned about agency overreach. And here they're worried that the agency is not doing enough. So uh, let's look at the case and see what happened. It's interesting in that sense. It's a nice counterexample. So Public Citizen is a consumer advocacy group that was founded by, by Ralph Nader and they challenged the Food and Drug Administration's decision to list two color additives as safe. And there were also some others listed as provisionally approved. And it did this under a theory that the cancer risk was de minimis uh, for these two color additives, though not zero. And in terms of main takeaway here, uh, just to ruin the surprise, the DC circuit held that the enabling statute basically did not allow the FDA to make these exceptions. In other words, they're trying to force the agency to follow the statute more rigidly. Um, these dyes, uh, that, that we're concerned about in this uh, case are in cosmetics, like lipsticks, face powders, and rouges, hair cosmetics and nail products, um, bath washes, and so forth. Um, and a scientific review panel had found the lifetime cancer risks of these dyes to be statistically small. Orange number 17, which is pictured on the next slide, was one in 19 billion at worst, right? And so you're, you could use it a lot and your chances of getting cancer from it were only one in 19 billion. And red number 19, which is pictured here, notice it's a green, it's green when it's in powder form or looks green, but when you dissolve it, it's kind of this vibrant, almost a reddish purple. And that was one in 9 million. Um, the FDA had kind of come up with some things that present a one in a million risk. That's a nice a round number as a comparison. And so, for example, if you, what's something that creates a one in a million risk of cancer? Eating one peanut every 20, 250 days or spending one day in Denver um, uh, a year. And that um, be just because of the radiation from the sun and so forth. Um, so it's a uh, one in a million risk. And um, to put this in perspective, that's a, a tiny fraction of the risk that a, an average male smoker is taking uh, for getting cancer, one in uh, 200,000th, the court points out. Now, let's talk about our statute. And the statute is kind of causing the problems here. Um, and uh, so, so for all of our uh, statute cases we study about vague statutes and the non-delegation doctrine. And uh, you may be wondering as a student, why doesn't Congress just make um, statutes more specific and spell out what they want? And then the agency could just mechanically follow that. Well, this is a case about how that can go wrong. Um, so the Delaney Clause, which is named after the congressman who introduced it, um, was passed in 1958. And it says a color additive shall be deemed unsafe and not be listed for any use. Uh, which will not result in ingestion of any part of such additive if um, after tests which are appropriate for the evaluation of the safety of additives for such use or after other relevant exposure of man or animal to such additive, it is found by the secretary to induce cancer in man or animal. And that last phrase is the, the whole part, the only thing we care about is that it can cause cancer or induce cancer. Um, and so we have a couple of problems with this. Uh, the number of potential food additives has increased dramatically since 1958. Probably in 1958, uh, Congress was thinking about the things that would be like listed as ingredients, right? So if you uh, hold up a, a bottle of something or a can of something or package of something in fine print, it lists the, the stuff that they put in kind of almost like the recipe, right? And as, um, but as with improved technology, chemists can put stuff in a machine and detect trace amounts, sometimes down to the molecular level of chemicals in food. 
So let's say you buy a, um, uh, a, an apple pie, right? Well, the apples that they, they may just say, we put apples and nothing is in here except the fruit, but the fruit itself contains trace amounts of pesticides and fertilizers and things like that. Sometimes uh, foods have, there's trace amounts of plastics. Um, so there's natural pathogens like toxins from mold and so forth. Um, the other problem is that there's a lot more chemicals that are known to cause cancer than were known in 1958 when only a handful, there were only a handful of known carcinogens in 1958, but the statute's still there, right? So uh, most chemicals, by the way, are not carcinogenic, contrary to popular beliefs that you've probably heard people say, well, everything causes cancer. And that's actually not true. It's not true that everything will cause cancer if you give enough of it to lab animals. But there are hundreds of things that do cause cancer. And, um, and there's enough of those things that people in modern societies are surrounded by carcinogens daily. So now let's talk about Young, our defendant. And this is Dr. Frank Young, who was the FDA commissioner under Ronald Reagan. Um, he had had a storied career first in the military and as a doctor and was even an ordained evangelical minister. And um, he, in the Reagan era, FDA had adopted a de minimis approach to cancer risk. So anything that was less than one in a million, they picked a nice round number, they thought was basically fine. We're not, it's not worth uh, creating a regulatory burden over that. So note that this was a departure, this de minimis approach to cancer risk was a departure from the agency's prior practice and was part of Reagan's overall deregulatory agenda. Um, the FDA thought that the cancer risk posed by these the two colors in this case, uh, that the cancer risk was trivial and they wanted to avoid imposing a seemingly unnecessary regulatory burden on the industry. So let's talk about the holding. The court rejects the FDA's approach as inconsistent with the clear language of the statute. So there's no de minimis exception in the Delaney Clause. The legislative history um, suggested that Congress at the time was responding to public alarm over cancer and that lawmakers thought color additives were actually not worth any cancer risk. In other words, they thought that the colors that are put in lipstick and makeup and um, shampoos and things like that um, were kind of silly and definitely not worth getting cancer for. So they, it seems like at least in 1958 that they wanted um, carcinogen-free products sold in American stores. The legislative history also indicated that the FDA would seek revisions of the law as necessary. And note that the FDA hadn't done that. They hadn't gone back to Congress and said, by the way, the technology has evolved. And so now we have a problem with the wording when it talks about food additives that now we can detect like trace amounts of things that we couldn't before. So we, you need to kind of define additive a little more clearly. And you may want to defined uh, carcinogen um, a little more precisely as um, something that's not a really remote risk. I um, pulled out a quote for you uh, that sort of captures the court's reasoning. The Delaney Clause of the Color Additive Amendments uh, does not contain an, even an implicit de minimis exception for carcinogenic dyes with trivial risks to humans. We base this decision not on our understanding that Congress adopted an extraordinarily rigid position denying the FDA authority to list a dye once it found it to induce a cancer in animals in the conventional sense of the term, right? Um, in other words, they thought that Congress had meant to be uh, rigid and uh, even if it seemed unreasonable. We believe that in the color additive context, Congress intended that if this rule produced unexpected or undesirable consequences, the agency should go to Congress, should come to it for relief. But that's not what they did. They just adopted kind of a, um, a, a de minimis rule and gave people a pass. The moment, that may, moment may well have arrived, but we cannot provide the desired escape. In other words, the courts, it's not the court's job to go to Congress, petition Congress for the agency. Now, um, in terms of an epilogue, Congress did fix this after this case, uh, about a few years after this case. So the Food Quality Protection Act of 1996, which was when there was a Republican controlled Congress, was a workaround for the Delaney Clause. It, it, they didn't exactly repeal the Delaney Clause, but the amended act excludes pesticide residues from the definition of food additive. 
um, and it adopts a substituting um, a safety standard for tolerance. And the act also gave the EPA, uh, not the FDA authority to use quantitative risk assessment, like the, which is basically what the FDA was trying to do here for pesticide residues. In other words, they kind of carved up responsibility to and gave part of it to the EPA and, um, and basically did what the FDA had been trying to do here. And that concludes our lecture about public citizen, the young.